Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another edition of the COVID Calls. I am your host, Ryan Pyle, and this is my Instagram Live. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I've got a pretty special guest. Uh, her name is Libby Hill. She is the current reigning Miss Earth USA, and we're going to learn a little bit about who she is, where she's come from, and how she has become the reigning Miss Earth uh, USA crown holder. Um, and I mean, that's just one of many, many things that she does. And yeah, and also to get a bit of a US perspective, because she's based in the United States at the moment. And I'm curious to see how she's doing and how this whole COVID-19 um, situation has affected her. Uh, how am I doing at the moment? I am doing well. My kitten whiskey is awesome and keeping me happy and well entertained. And uh, yeah, Istanbul is great. It's kind of opening up a little bit right now. So it's a little bit touch and go if it's going to be like a good opening up or if there's going to be another wave of, uh, of virus infections and then they'll close it back down again. But um, hey, this is the world we live in today. But I'm doing great. I'm happy and I'm healthy. And I hope all of you are too. So now let's go to our guest, uh, Libby Hill. I'm just bringing chat. And once she's in, we are going to learn everything we can about her in one hour or less. And connecting. Hello. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? Not too bad. Thank you so much for joining me. I absolutely appreciate it. It's very early in the morning in your part of the world. Oh, it's nine. It's nine. <laughs> that's Come on. That's not bad. That's, that's early for quarantine. It's not, uh, early. it's not early when we have things to do each day. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm trying to stay busy. Are you? Um, still stay a little bit busy and stay on a bit of a schedule. Um, for a while there, I definitely slept in, but I'm back to getting to it. Fantastic. So where are you in the world at the moment? So I'm in Texas, Austin, Texas right now. That's great. And that's where you live full time? It is. My family is back in Galveston. I actually just went to visit them for kind of a long weekend. We had a lot of celebrations going on. Oh, this is my cat that I promised would probably join us so <laughs> wow that cat is much bigger than my cat <laughs> he's huge his name is tubby he is a tom cat that was pulled out of a junkyard and he lives up to his name <laughs> oh, okay very nice there's something quite special about cats that you rescue isn't it yeah it is. yeah oh now yeah. he's gonna move my camera <laughs> no worries so um so you're in austin texas but uh let's go back because obviously i I, you know, I did a little bit of research on you online. Uh, mm -hmm. I know you're the reigning Miss Earth USA, but I'm kind of curious as to w what that entails, first of all, but how you got there. So maybe we can just start at the beginning and see where it takes us. Yeah. So um, as far as getting there, it is a pageant. So it's a national pageant. Um, we started with local competitions. So I was Miss Gulf Coast. That's where I'm from, Texas Gulf Coast. Um, like I said, my family's from Galveston. And then last August, I guess it was last August, we competed for the national title in Las Vegas. Um, and I actually placed first runner up at that pageant, but the girl who won ended up going on to the international competition and placed in their court. So then I assumed the title in, I guess that was October that she placed. So since then I have been Miss Earth USA and I will be until August. Okay. Wow, so it's kind of like a one year reign and then and then you have to hand it over to whoever's next. You do, you do, yes. So you have uh -huh. a huge impact and the pageant works, everyone who competes has an environmental platform and they've had to educate their community, organize events that are based around their platform. Mine was coastal restoration. Um, okay. so I've done a lot of work in the wetlands in the bay by my house in Galveston. And then I've gotten to go across the country a little bit, do some cleanups, do some restoration work um, on a few coasts in the U.S. It was my goal to finish all of them. But with COVID, I don't really know how that's going to pan out. Yeah, I think it, this has thrown a wrench in a lot of people's plans. Um, one of the fun things about my show or my Instagram live is we end up having guests from kind of all over the world. So today, mm -hmm. you know, we've got people listening from Singapore, from Taiwan, from even from Hong Kong, um, I have, a, I have a, a decent following in Asia just because uh, some of my TV shows play there. So 
um, you know, coastal restoration in, in places like Taiwan and Hong Kong and Singapore and places like that are, is super important. So what does, what does the Gulf coast of Texas, uh, look like? Like, is it, um, is it kind of like swamp wetlands or is it like a rocky coastline? I mean, I'm sure it's different in a lot of places, but a lot, a lot of people listening might have never been to Texas and have no idea of like visually what that entails. Yeah, so we do have beaches. Um, there are sand beaches, uh, some rocky coastline, but mostly it's just sand beaches. Um, and then our water has this really unique uh, brown tint to it uh, because the sand and the mud that we have that lines the bottom of our ocean and our bays, um, it's brown and sticky. So, um, you know, in the sunlight, it makes a really pretty color, but it's it's definitely not... Uh, the Floridian beach that you would think of, which is also part of the Gulf Coast, but very different from Texas. Okay, fantastic. So where did your journey begin? So so take me back to Galveston, Texas, when you were born. I mean, what were you interested in as a kid? So I was actually born in Houston, and my family moves out to Galveston a little bit later in life. But Sorry to make that assumption. So similar, similar regions. So when I was younger, I always loved animals. I think that's probably the biggest thing that's drawn me to the environment and protecting the environment. Um, so when I was really young, you know, always had pets, always loved pets. Um, I was a dancer. I loved adventuring. I loved staying active. I loved being outside. Um, that's still true. You can just send me out. There's some woods behind my apartment complex right now. Um, I can just run around in nature and just enjoy it and soak it up for forever if you let yeah. me so that's beautiful me too i feel the same way and it's uh ter terrible right now we're all kind of stuck indoors mm -hmm. well i've been really grateful for nature lately because without it i think i would be going insane i'm very used to being on the road and traveling a lot and so being still has been an adjustment yes i'm sure you understand that feeling more than anyone well, I don't, I don't know if you know, like I was, uh, I travel about 300 days a year making adventure television shows and uh, I live in Dubai, but I'm, I'm not there very often. Mm -hmm. And I was actually filming in Ethiopia, one of my episodes when the world closed. And, you know, for those people who don't really know, like if you're, if you're, if you're in your home and you work, you know, in the same country where your home is and you don't have to travel that much. You might not know, but the whole world is like closed, like borders are closed. Airlines are not flying. So uh, I was in Ethiopia and when I was filming there, the United Arab Emirates uh, closed their borders, which is where Dubai is. That's my home. So I couldn't go home. Um, so I so I went to one of the only places I could go, which was Turkey. And I've been in Istanbul now for seven and a half weeks. My goodness. How yes. did you find somewhere to live? How did you adjust to that so quickly? Um, well, I'm kind of, I've kind of lived a pretty homeless existence for many years now. So I'm kind of home anywhere. I feel very comfortable just hanging out pretty much anywhere. And I was at a hotel for a little while. And then uh, when I realized that this was going to take a lot longer than everyone thought, I moved into an apartment and uh, rescued a small kitten. Uh, and he's been keeping me company. And then I've been doing these COVID calls or these Instagram live chats just to meet new people and reconnect with old friends and keep myself mentally sane. Yes, that's important. Big question on my mind, is Whiskey going to make the trip back to Dubai? Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, he has a little passport already, and uh, I got him a little passport. Yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty awesome. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'll bring him back to Dubai with me. And then uh, I there's been, like, a fight over my friends in Dubai as to who will look after him while I'm traveling and working again. So we'll see how it goes. He'll be your cat, like, 65 days of the year. <laughs> Yeah, sadly, yeah. I hope he remembers me. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you grew up. You loved the outdoors. You loved nature. Um, you were always very, very active. You liked dancing. You mentioned. Um, did you any? Did you play any organized sports or team sports or anything like that? I'm always curious. So, I actually was a Division One athlete at UT in Austin. I was on the rowing team. Okay. So that was kind of my sport. I'm a, I don't have the best hand-eye coordination, but I'm more of an endurance athlete. So okay. like running, rowing, dancing, uh, those are great. But if you ask me to catch a ball, it might not happen. Might not happen. Okay. Well, that's good. You have other, you've identified other skills. <laughs> so 
Um, that's good that you realized that an eye hand coordination wasn't your strong suit. I played basketball and rugby, so I was I was maybe I was maybe the other way around. Yeah, I played basketball um, in Canada, Division One, which was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, when I was in, I think, seventh and eighth grade, and okay. I'm really strong on the defense, um, <laughs> but not so much the, the shooting. Yeah, I'm trying to get some of my old teammates to join me on these calls, but they're all, they all have no interest, and it's, it's tough. It's tough to get them out. Yeah. Um, okay, so you, you Division One athlete, you know, you're rowing. What did you study in university? I'm curious. What does, what does a Miss World USA or Miss Earth USA study? in university? So I have a degree in human biology. And oh, wow. I'm, yeah, I'm currently getting a degree in uh, dietetics, which is nutrition for people who maybe aren't as familiar with that word. Um, mm -hmm. So it's the clinical side of nutrition. It's more focused on medical nutrition um, okay. and kind of healing the body through food as opposed to some of the more mainstream uh, you know, medicines, so, right. or in conjunction with them. Uh, it's very popular in a lot of hospitals. It saves a lot of money on healthcare, and it also gives people the best chance to maybe not have to have such strong medication burdens. Yeah, no, that's fascinating because actually my guest last night, uh, his name was Luke Greenfield Shaw, and mm -hmm. he is a cancer survivor. And he was talking about how he changed his diet uh, in coordination with his... Um, with his chemotherapy and, and his and his situation and how he feels that it definitely didn't hurt. I mean, it he doesn't know how much it helped because you don't really know when you beat cancer, you don't always know exactly why or how. But it was one of the things that he did that he felt, you know, just helped him overall be successful. And um, yeah, that's that's amazing. I mean, this is the future, right? We can't just keep putting crap in our bodies and expect to live. It really is. And for me, dietetics is kind of a beautiful metaphor for sustainability in general because we're yeah. looking at solutions to prevent disease to prevent destruction um, instead of trying to fix the problem after it's happened so like you just said even with cancer outcomes if you keep a person's lean body mass high if you give them enough protein and enough calories um, and work kind of against the side effects of all the medications they're on the the rate for survival just shoots up exponentially it's something like 40 percent higher um, survival rate wow. if you have nutrition therapy. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, prevention over over you know treating the problem once it's been created is is crucial. I think the whole world could use a little of that right now, whether it's regard to what we're putting into our body or just what we're injecting into the atmosphere and, and our earth and our oceans. Right. Yeah. Okay. So so you you studied and then so how do you go from being like a a, a, new, a, a, new, a dietitian nutrition focused science student to being in in it's a it's a pageant like miss earth usa i don't it's not like a beauty pageant is it or is there there it seems like there's way more depth to it there is so okay it's a pageant but it's very unique in the sense that all the candidates have to have an environmental platform and they have to demonstrate a commitment to that platform and actually go through the motions of um like creating events and doing restoration before they even step on stage oh so, wow where a lot of um, pageant systems, they're open to whatever platform you want. This one is specifically focused on creating young women who are now advocates for the environment and have this experience from which they can speak. Um, and the idea is if we have representatives in each state or each region, then at the end of the day, we have at least one really strong, well-educated environmentalist um, who hopefully people can look up to, hopefully young women can look up to and realize that you know, anyone can be interested in the environment. Anyone can care for the environment. And there are so right. many ways to do it. Um, you know, you can be a beauty queen and still love to, for me, it's going out, uh, doing restoration work, like climbing into the bay, getting muddy, planting trees, planting grass. Um, yeah. So I, I like to think it breaks a few borders in terms of how we picture environmentalists. And, and beauty pageant winners. Yes, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think I think I mean having a role model is so important, and and I think that when you can mix, um, you know, beauty brains and a care for the environment, then you're creating maybe a whole new generation of young women, uh, girls maybe at the moment, you know, young women in a decade from now who are going to carry the same 
platform and the same initiatives that people like yourself are setting out. And maybe that's how a change begins. That's the dream. That's the dream. <laughs> that's the dream. Inspire that next generation because they're hurting the problem. The yeah. They are. They are. So, so you won your crown uh, last year uh, in mm -hmm. Las Vegas. Or, uh, so you obtained your crown last year in Las Vegas. Um, so what's, what's the, you know, what was the first few months like? What kinds of activities did you have to do? What kinds of things did you organize? Where did you go? Because I'm, like, I'm, I, I know who you are, but I'm, compl I'm completely ignorant about the process. Yeah, so um, let's see. When I got my title, I, yep. you know, honestly, not a ton changed for me because I was already doing the work with my local title. Mm -hmm. um, I did, like I said, I made a resolution to myself that I wanted to do a restoration project or a cleanup on every coast in the U.S. So I made it out to the West Coast. I went to California, did a cleanup with some of the girls in California, and then I made it to Hawaii. Um, all of this was with the pageant, and I organized with the, the local queens there, and we worked on some restoration projects. Uh, that actually got cut short because as, you know, COVID was happening, I got out there kind of right before things became serious. And halfway through the trip, we had to kind of shut down everything and I had to head home. Okay. Um, but I did have a cleanup planned for the Great Lakes and getting out to the East Coast. Unfortunately, those were uh, cut short. Obviously, we got the Gulf, the Gulf Coast covered. That's great. That's great. So so what is the what do these cleanups entail? Like, I mean... What are, are you going out looking for like specific garbage? Are you going out looking for plastics? Like I'm, what, what is it? I mean, it's you and other, uh, your, you know, your community of other like-minded people, um, mm -hmm. maybe other volunteers, you know, but what do you, what exactly are you guys looking for? Obviously the beaches are filthy. There's a ton of stuff there, but what's your, what's your main focus? So we have, we're actually sponsored by the Clean Earth Project and this uh, company called Garbo Grabber. They have these awesome like garbage receptacles that you can kind of prop on your hip and go out and pick up trash pretty easily. So um, we go around, we pick up the big trash in those. And then it's kind of something that's been a real issue in our oceans um, is this microplastic problem. Right. Um, we put plastics into the ocean. Um, they get beaten by the waves and over time the environment just creates these tiny little pieces of plastic that are floating out into our waterways um, fish are eating them they're contributing to pollution and sometimes they'll wash up on shore um, into these regions that almost look like rainbow sand uh, right. so one of the things if i see an area like that i'll stop and i will go through the motions of you know scraping out that microplastic waste so that's been um, another component of the cleanups that I'm doing. Obviously, they're all focused on the beaches. Um, and then when I'm landlocked in Austin, I've been going out in the woods and doing some cleanups myself here. Wow, that's fantastic. And I guess, I mean, you're also promoting this on social media. And I'm sure that when all when the when you're when you're, you know, your group of other women and men and whoever else is like minded, you guys are able to get quite a bit of media attention as well, like maybe getting people out of the local. Do you guys work with schools at all? Um, I did some education with schools before all this shut down. So going into classrooms and kind of teaching kids about it. I also had um, a big event planned with the Girl Scouts of Central Texas yeah. um, that has also been pushed to something virtual that hopefully we'll get going in the next few weeks. Um, we were going to teach them about recycling, do a cleanup on one of the local lakes here, um, right. and then also do an art project with some sort of recycled or upcycled materials so for me getting kids involved is such like it's it's integral to the whole process because if you can get them starting to think about what waste am i generating where does this go how do we stop this waste i think that's the real solution cleanups are great um but i think that they're great to expose people to the problem so that hopefully we can take action to prevent it from ever happening and that means right. stopping plastic production or consumption. Right. Just like Thomas says here, he says plastic is such an issue in the United Kingdom where he lives. Uh, he mm -hmm. can't understand why supermarkets continue to package tons of plastic. It also leads to a lot of food waste. And of course, this goes very much in line with what you studied and, and your, your other profession, which is, you know, preventative, essentially preventative healthcare through, through proper dieting and proper um, nutrition. 
and you know it's it's a prevention not treatment and cleaning up the oceans and cleaning up the beaches is the treatment and we need to think about prevention we do and actually um i love that thomas mentioned food waste because yeah. that something that I've kind of really taken to heart as I go through my program, as I study to become a registered dietitian, you realize that there is such a huge issue with food waste. And I think 30 to 40% of it happens at the consumer level. So that's food that you're throwing away straight from, you know, a restaurant or straight from your grocery, um, like the groceries in your fridge. And so, I mean, that's a huge problem. And so how we source food and what food we're choosing to eat and source, I, I think that's going to be my next big move um, in terms of what I focus on in, in the environmental and sustainability realms, because it's going to be directly into my profession. In, uh, so I travel around the world quite a bit, and I'm in a lot of different countries all the time. And then I also spend quite a bit of time in the United States because like anyone who makes television and stuff like that, you always end up working with a lot of people in the U.S. And I find that in grocery stores around the world, um, the portions are, are of like meat and the prepackaged food and stuff like that is all very like reasonable. And then when you come into the United States and also the United Kingdom to some extent, uh, the portions are ridiculously huge. And it's just like, you know how can anyone eat that much? And then if they don't eat that much, where does it end up? And, Mm -hmm. and I just feel like, um, you know, the boxed food is too much. The, you know, the way they package everything is just jumbo this jumbo that, um, you know, discounting for buying more than you need. Uh, And there's just so much of a business involved in getting people to over consume or over purchase and then throw out um, that, you know, eventually someone has to, I don't know. Do you put a law in place? Do you? How do you change people's attitudes towards these kinds of bargain um, deals or this kind of overpackaging or an over oversized? What am I trying to say? Like an oversized um, uh, the bulk you know, portions. Yeah. Like uh, what's that? What? Then everyone ends up buying that way because it's cheaper. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. There's uh, not well, uh, Costco. Mm-hmm. Costco is one of those big U.S. Um, shops where you go in and you can just buy tons and tons of stuff uh, at huge discounts. And, and um, yeah, those are huge in America. And, uh, again, you said 40% of the food waste is coming from people at the consumer level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and consumers are choosing to foods that might be – choosing to consume foods that might be a little bit tougher on the environment when you start to think about how your seafood is sourced, how your meat is sourced, um, and even – you know, even if it's a vegetable, just figuring out if it's coming from a farm that's being responsible with their water usage, with their pesticide usage. Um, you know, not everyone can, it, it's not a socioeconomic reality that everyone can eat organic or, you know, go totally vegan. It's just, it, that is not yet feasible, but teaching people to make better decisions and even just teaching people what the appropriate serving sizes, what an appropriate portion looks like, I think can go a long way. So maybe it's not the government's responsibility, but it, it can definitely be something that we take on. Right. Um, hopefully I can encourage some other future dietitians to make that promise to themselves as practitioners that they'll educate people, not just from a health pers- perspective, but from an environmental one as well. Yeah. Cause the, you know, that overconsumption also, uh, also is terrible. Um, mm-hmm. Has, yeah, just too much meat and too much everything. Uh, so Thomas is just saying here, we find here if you buy prepackaged, it's so much cheaper than buying from a butcher, but it puts so many small businesses out of business. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's kind of true too. Um, okay, so you were in you were in Hawaii. Let mm-hmm. me get back to this. You were in Hawaii doing one of your uh, coastal cleanups, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden, this would have been what, like in mid March or early March. Um, yes. And, uh, and think about, I mean, what went through your mind as this was kind of unfolding in the United States? Like, what, what was your, what was kind of your timeline and your thought process to like, it's time to go back to Texas? So it actually hit me pretty suddenly. I think that I was aware of the virus, but, um, especially when I got to Hawaii, um, it was so weird. It was like this, this bubble where it hadn't really hit yet and people weren't really talking about the virus and people weren't really worried about going out in public. 
Um, and in Texas, where there are already been a bit more of an impact. Um, it was just a very different perspective. It's like you walked in and the island was okay. Right. So um, when Hawaii started to shut down their restaurants and things like that, that's when I, it kind of clicked. And, you know, obviously you're stuck in Turkey, but I had no idea if I was going to be able to get on a plane and get back to Texas. And so I think that's kind of what ended up sending me home was the uncertainty of what what's going to happen with travel yeah it, it's kind of freaky isn't it mm-hmm. I, it's, it's amazing that you were able to get back from hawaii i mean and and when you when you when you landed in uh, you know in texas uh at the i guess the austin airport what what was what was the mood like when you landed back in kind of mainland usa or you know mm-hmm. where were people taking everyone's temperatures at the airport? I mean, was everyone wearing gloves and masks or what was, what was the situation? No, it was, it was before. I think really anyone truly understood how this virus was going to progress. So um, in Hawaii, like I said, people weren't really concerned um, quite yet. I think after that, you know, they hit the progression that we've all hit. Um, it was just delayed reaching Hawaii. And I actually had to fly back through Dallas, which is, kind of the hub of Corona in Texas um, at this point right now. And it was a very drastic difference between kind of the relaxed feel in Hawaii. And then in Dallas, um, I was nervous. I, you know, fabric over my face at that point, I I didn't have a mask, but when I got back to Austin, the airport was empty, just totally, totally empty because I think before it became a real issue here, before we had the cases coming, we saw what was happening to Dallas and larger cities like Houston. And so, um, yeah, we kind of got ahead of it and people really cleared out of the airport. Wow. So, uh, just, just to let you, just to let you know what happened to me, I was like three days, um, without an internet signal and without a mobile phone signal, we were trekking in the mountains filming. And then we got up to the top of this, like 16, 16,000 foot like mountain top, but more like a high pass. And our guide was like, okay, guys, you know, your phones will work here because we hadn't been connected for a few days. And that was on March the 19th. And, um, and that was like, when we turned on our phones, we're standing on this 16,000 foot ridge, looking over the Simeon mountains, you know, South Sudan is just over, you know, to the left and, and southern Ethiopia is down to the right, and we're just standing there, and it's beautiful. We turn on our phones, and it was like Italy has closed their borders. The United States has stopped flights to Europe. You know, the EU has closed their borders. And then the United Arab Emirates, uh, which is where I live, had closed their borders. And we uh, we called the driver that we knew, and we trekked like four or five hours straight back to the road uh, and then drove all night to get kind of get back to the the main airport and then flew out basically anywhere we could that same day. Um, and, uh, and then when I landed in Istanbul, the airport was empty. And I just remember, I, I posted this on my Instagram page. I just remember looking up at one of those boards that shows all the flights and they were just like all canceled. And I was, I, I just was, I just felt like I was in zo- like a zombie apocalypse. I was like, what is going on? And um, it was kind of scary. And then I came into a very, very empty Istanbul. Uh, a city of 18 million that you could like drop a coin and hear it for miles away. Yeah. And it must be crazy going from that isolation in nature to suddenly walking back into what you expect to be normal civilization. Yeah. Business as usual. That's insane. Also, how do I get your job? Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, a lot of pain, a lot of yeah. pain. Uh, the entertainment industry is fickle and cruel, but if you can kind of just deal with it for 10 years or so, someone might give you a chance, but it can be rough. Um, but we do get to travel. We used to get to travel quite a bit and it was, there were a lot of perks. Um, so you're back in Texas, you're back in Austin. I mean, what are your, you know, you come back in March right after you come back from Hawaii. Um, and you're watching the news, you're talking to your friends, like, what's the mood? Like, I'm not in the United States. My father actually lives in California, um, and he's under total lockdown because he's in a, that age bracket that's in at a, quite a dangerous stage. But, I mean, what are your friends and family all saying? Is everyone just, you know, huddled up at home and staying home, or, or is Texas more open? Uh, is Austin more open? Yeah, so we're locked down. Our state actually just reopened a few 
I have no sense of time anymore, but I think a week ago, probably we started to reopen. Um, restaurants started to come back in service with, you know, limited patrons allowed to attend. Um, but I, you know, they're really kind of two competing like theories about the coronavirus right now. Um, right. Oh, there's an ear. Hello. Sorry. Yeah. Is, is your cat, is your cat that big or is he just really close to the camera? He's a big boy. <laughs> Yeah, oh, Jesus. <laughs> he's, he's like a dog cat. Your cat's like this big right now. <laughs> my cat sits on my little shoulder. Yeah, that's hilarious. Well, Tubby tries to do that too, but you know, it's, yeah. it's just not as comfortable, I'm sure. Um, so, anyways, uh, I, sorry, Rain, Rain is just saying here that uh, California is now talking about a lockdown until July. Wow. Yeah. That's it's, crazy. I think that it's regional. Uh, different countries have had different impacts with the virus and the disease and um, the death rates. So I th and you know cities like New York, it's just not feasible. People even on the streets are in close quarters. So it's definitely regional how people are reacting. Here, um, a lot of people are taking it safe. A lot of people are staying locked down. I was quarantined for two months before I went to even visit my family. Um, wow. And then you have the other people who are just dying to get out. So um, yeah. they closed some of our parks, but people have still been getting out and going uh, to the lake, going on walks, trying to stay active. So Austin's an incredibly outdoor oriented city. So we've seen a, a lot of people out in nature, but as far as businesses, people are staying home, staying locked down. And, and, and when you, and when you do go out for a run or when you go out for a walk, like, what do you see? Like, is it just grocery stores and pharmacies that are open or, or are, you know, people trying to do takeaway food delivery? I mean, what, what, how, like, what are you seeing when you go out? Yeah, there's lots of takeaway. Um, coffee shops are closed really unless they have a drive through or they'll let one people in. I've seen, there was a smoothie shop that's kind of local to Austin. And Fantastic. And, right basically shoved tables and pallets in front of the door so that nobody could get in and they would just leave the door open and leave a little credit card thing. Um, and then you would just kind of scream your order in and then they'd be like, back up. And you'd, you know, they'd bring your smoothie out and put it down. But I mean, so here I think people are definitely taking it seriously and I appreciate that. I have asthma. So I was really concerned about this. Um, a flu sends me to the hospital. So I'm, I'm not taking any chances. No, that's, that's terrifying. Well, I was actually, I mean, I was actually in China during the, the first SARS uh, outbreak in 2003 and 2004. And I was a mm -hmm. journalist working for like the New York times back then. And, um, and yeah, that was terrifying as well because, because at that time there was just a huge cover up about what was going on and no one mm -hmm. wanted to like be honest about it. And now I feel like um, everything is, well, at least at the moment, everything is much more transparent than it was then. I mean, there's still lots of transparency issues, but um, but how fast this went global and how scary it is and how people are are you know having their incomes and their their financial lives ruined in many ways. Um, it's terrifying. Yeah. How, what was yeah. the difference in social climate between the two? You said people weren't really as aware. Were people walking around? They didn't know what was going on, or well, in, in, in Hong Kong, so Hong Kong has a much more free media um, mm -hmm. than, than mainland China. So in Hong Kong, uh, when I was there during SARS, like people were talking about it every day and mm -hmm. people were wearing masks and not really going out too much. But people are still going out and, and living their daily lives. Like, you know, during SARS, like most businesses stayed open. Um, mm -hmm. That there were like the airlines kept flying. I remember during SARS, I was on a flight from London to Hong Kong, and my plane was like empty. There were like five of us on it, but the planes were still flying. Um, but in mainland China, they kept saying that you know there were no cases and there there were no cases, and people in Shanghai, which is where I was living at the time, um, they we were all just kind of unaware. Uh, of what what was going on, and of course now everyone in China is well aware of what's going on, and now I guess questions are still arising as to like where it came from, and and you know will this happen again, or will there be another wave, which is uh, which is terrifying because I have a lot of work in China, and I still have a lot of um, people do I do business with there, so it's uh, yeah it's a lot of uncertainty. I think that's what we're concerned about too. Here is 
you know, our peak in Austin was delayed. So we're still waiting to kind of see what the brunt of the disease looks like here. Um, but also just, is it going to come back? Is there going to be a resurgence? If not, when we open things back up, then when the winter months hit and we're under the same climate conditions or weather yeah. conditions, so. So um, I'm curious, you know, like obviously people have lost their jobs, people are mm -hmm. losing their homes, uh, people are dying. This is all like a terribly, terribly tough time uh, for a lot, a lot of people. I'm curious just, you know, within this conversation, how this is affecting your world. Um, you mentioned having to cut trip, uh, had having to cut a trip short to Hawaii to do uh, a coastal restoration project. You know, what, what else have you had to cut in the last few weeks, uh, two months really? And, and, and what have you been doing to stay busy? So my life has changed quite a bit. As I said, I'm always on the go. Um, I was set to host uh, world oceans day in Galveston, um, which was a weekend long festival. I had a lot of events planned um, in the local community and also in different parts of the country. So obviously all of those uh, were cut short. And then the biggest impact that it's had on me, I'm actually in my clinical rotations for dietetics right now. So it's, you know, how doctors go through different hospitals or different specialties to try and figure out what they want to do and become well-versed in all of them. So I was supposed to be rotating through hospitals right now. And actually the hospital I was supposed to be in is a COVID testing center. And they actually had, yeah. So they actually had to turn us away because yeah. the school couldn't take on the liability of sending people basically into the front lines um, to, to learn. So my clinical program has been put online and it's going to look like that until I graduate, which should be in August. So until the completion of my program, I'm doing it from a computer. And wow. that really, you know, you do a, a case study online and it's, here's someone with diabetes. And then you go into a hospital and it's such a more complex issue. These people have lives and they have considerations to make about what's the reality of their socioeconomic status. What's the... Like, what are they capable of doing? What are they willing to do? And so you miss that really human interaction and that human learning experience that I think probably differentiates between a good practitioner and a great practitioner. So I'm going to have a lot of catch up to do on the job when all this is over. Yeah, I mean, um, so I have another friend of mine who, who I spoke with a few days ago. His name is Benjamin Chan, and he's in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, and his claim to fame is that at 19 years old, he became the youngest person uh, born in Hong Kong to climb Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. And he's currently going he's currently going through medical school right now. And and he's just like, all my classes are online and we're not talking to any patients. And he's like, you know, I might graduate, but like, what kind of a doctor am I going to be? <laughs> because because, you know, most of what's important about being a doctor is, number one, I'm guessing I'm. I'm hypothesizing, but you know, you have to know your stuff, but then you also have to understand people and, and their emotions and, you know, how to deliver information to people in a way that, you know, keeps people calm and, and you can deliver information to someone who is receptive to it. And like the communication elements of being a good doctor is something you don't learn in a textbook. Like that's something you do when you spend time, you know, years in hospitals working, um, and dealing with patients. And now all of that is, is you're the second person I've talked to who's kind of in the healthcare uh, medical field who should be in a hospital working with patients and is now kind of doing stuff from home. Yeah, it's challenging yeah. for sure. I, I have a lot of fear surrounding that, but I know it's going to be okay. I'm a very optimistic person. I like to just look at the positives. I'm getting a really great textbook education and maybe that will help me, you know, see something that maybe most people don't. So... A lot of you're on you're the so job. positive. You're so positive. I love it. I love it. Uh, from Istanbul, I'm trying to stay. I'm trying to reach your level of positivity. Well, it's hard sometimes. Some days are easier than others. But I think, you know, waking up, getting dressed, taking a walk outside, those little things are pretty life-saving right now. And I also <laughs> hope that this gives people a, a solid appreciation for nature because that's kind of our only escape right now. And... Maybe more people. I'm really sorry. He loves the spotlight. 
everyone loves everyone loves a cat so the more time he gets the more popular this video is going to be and the more people will get get to, uh, the more people will know your message and hear your message and listen to me talk a little here's a question for you this this whole global shutdown we're having is actually having a wonderful effect on the environment mm -hmm. and you know birds are now back in places they've never they haven't been in decades or centuries as well as um as ocean mammals are now coming back uh right up to the shore you know in places they haven't been in in decades and and it's like we're almost giving the earth a chance to breathe again mm -hmm. and um i have a very good friend of mine in dubai and he's like you know he's been there for like 10 years or 12 years and he was like this is the first time in the summer where he can actually like see the downtown area so it doesn't you know because there's no pollution um you know i mean what do you do you have an opinion about any of that because you are miss earth usa you know what is what's what is the earth benefiting from our our lockdown i think it's i mean everything you're saying i think it's so beautiful that people get a chance to see that our daily actions actually do have this cumulative impact that affects the environment um, right. in ways that and also that the environment can be healed that's the other thing you know a lot of people have this notion that you know oh it's too far gone what is it going to matter if I help? What is it going to matter if I make a change? Well, here's the thing. If cumulatively we all throw away that attitude, here's proof that the environment can heal, can change, can get better. Um, and I think it gives us all an opportunity to rethink things like, does everyone need a daily commute? Do we need to be putting that uh, pollution out there? Um, it gives us a chance to really reconsider our reliance on things like paper products and single use products, um, things that for a while there we couldn't get a hold of. Um, and we had to find a way to live without them. We had to use cloth towels and uh, you know, we survived. So hopefully it gives people an opportunity to see change can be made um, and life can go on in a better way. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Rain here made a fantastic joke. She says, uh, Tubby shows that everything is really bigger in Texas. And I yes. think that's a, that's a fantastic one. Um, uh, do you have a, oh wait, uh, someone's asking you right now, do you have a plan uh, to go for the title of Miss Texas USA? Is that, a, is Miss Texas USA a thing? Yes, Miss Texas USA, it's under the Miss Universe pageant system. Okay. And I actually do not. Um, I'm going to consider myself retired. I aged out of the USA system. So um, this is my title and I'm going to make the most of it. Okay, great. So, um, so what do you, I mean, it's, it's probably pretty conceivable that it's going to be really hard for you to hold any events in the coming months as you lead into your, your handover of your crown um you know how are you trying to stay active every day i mean i i saw on your instagram you were doing a photo shoot the other day um mm -hmm. like i i mean i'm just curious as to like what your days look and how you're continuing to to promote your message yeah so that was kind of my first venture out into the world um, and we did it very socially distanced um friendly as you could see it was a, a long lens that you know nobody had to get close to anybody um, so I did that shoot with my dog, Louie, and it's going to be about uh, sustainable products and sustainable living for pet owners and for your animals. So um, I'm really trying to push the media side of things, really trying to get the word out there as much as possible while people have the time to consume it. Yeah. Um, so doing things like that, trying to connect with people like you. Um, I've also done a few virtual tours and virtual contributions to things like Bay Day and Earth Day celebrations um, for different organizations that I believe in. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I've been doing. And then I've been obviously going out in the woods in my local community where nobody is and trying to clean up out there and keep my restoration boots muddy, you know? Absolutely. You got to stay in the field, keep working. <laughs> I can't get too lazy with that. So yeah, no. I'm doing school from home, so I have a little bit more flexibility in my schedule. Um, so just That's, just trying to stay sane, stay active. Yeah, I had a really difficult time actually. The first few weeks I was in uh, Istanbul, I didn't know like how long I would be here for. Mm -hmm. So I really felt like I was in limbo, and that was like really exhausting. Like I woke up every day tired. I went to bed every day tired the kind of uncertainty of where I was going to have to go next or what was going to happen. 
because I actually had to change hotels midway through because one hotel just closed. Like almost all the hotels in the city are closed. So there was only one I could stay at basically. And there were like three of us in a 500 room hotel. And uh, and then once the, the government basically said that they would be closed at least for another two months, then I kind of moved into an apartment. And that coincided around the same time I found my kitten. And, and the great thing is, is that once I found my kitten, I stopped watching television. So every night I was just watching hours of whatever was on whatever streaming platform I could find. And uh, and I just found it like soul destroying. But now I've got this little kitten and the power of pet ownership is a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just left for what, five days, and when I got back, Tubby will not leave my side. Oh, that's, oh, that's beautiful. Velcro cat. <laughs> that's fantastic. So um, I, I wanted to kind of go back a little bit further. I missed, I missed a point between when you graduated from university uh, mm -hmm. and when you uh, may, started to make your, your push towards Miss Earth USA. What did that middle ground look like, and how did – how did you go? Were you always in, interested in, in the pageant world, even as a university student? How did you how did you graduate and then get into the pageant world? What's that story? So I actually when I graduated, I went in, I was working in clinical trial research. And so I was working directly with patients um, and you know doing research and everything. And then I decided to go back to school for dietetics. And when I went back to school, I was working as a high school science and math teacher. And I actually had one client whose mom was really big in the pageant scene. And I come from a family where, I mean, I think we watched Miss America on TV back when it aired, but, you know, we weren't pageant girls. I've modeled since I was young, but it was kind of an unknown world to me and to my family. And this uh, tutoring client really encouraged me to take a shot. I had, I think at that year or at that point, one year of eligibility left. And so I did, I competed in a pageant and I was like, this is going to be my one shot. I'm going to do it. It's going to be a life experience. Thanks universe. And then I decided, I love this. This is awesome. Right. How do I do this again? So I started doing my research. I found the earth system, which fit so beautifully with the way I was living, the things that I cared about. And so I went out for Miss Earth um, and here we are. Wow. So I had That's a very short pageant career. It was only a year long, but I'm definitely one of those people who, when I find something I love, I really, really push and really research. And, you know, if you're going to do it, do it right. So accelerated and bit thorough. <laughs> That's fantastic. So what, I mean, obviously we're in a, a terrible kind of situation at the moment, but in a post COVID world, what does, what does your trajectory look like once you hand over your crown? Are you, are you part of an alumni network of, of, of other women who have worn the crown? Are you, are you continuing to engage with that community to continue pushing sustainability um, and, and your cleanup projects? I mean, or do you just kind of drop it and then move on to something else? I hope not. No, I mean, you don't. They don't just they don't just kick you out and be like, see you later. Thanks for your year. No, so we yeah. have okay. what we call a sisterhood, and so as you compete in a pageant, if you've ever been a title holder, you always have your title for that year, and so you can. You're a former Miss Earth USA, um, and I would really hope that nobody who has ever worn a title like Miss Earth um, would be able to let go of their commitment to the environment or their commitment to sustainability. So I will definitely continue um, doing my restoration projects whenever I can get out to the coast. And when I can't, um, like I said, I really want to try and figure out how we can make our food systems more sustainable and how I can make that accessible to people um, in their everyday life. So as a dietitian and a practitioner, that's another way that I really want to attack sustainability in my future career. That's amazing. So one of the things that I've actually kind of you know, enjoyed. Wow, that cat just barked. Um, one of the, <laughs> one of the. Like, I always say he sounds like a smoker. Yeah. <laughs> just... um, one of the one of the things that I've actually been kind of you know pleasantly surprised by this whole lockdown is just how much time I get to hang out with the people who follow me online, who I don't really get to interact with very much. Usually, I just kind of post a photo or a video, and then some people like it, and there's a few comments, and then we all move on, and. And now I've kind of really embraced 
um, you know, reaching out to my, my own little community a lot more. And I just wondering for you to have the platform of Miss Earth USA, um, how, how kind of exciting has it been for you to be online during this time and maybe having more intimate connection with your community online? Because I, in some way, it can be helpful to get across a message, you know, when everyone, like you said, when everyone has more time um, to consume it, which is definitely something that's happening now. Mm -hmm. I have, I am not the best social media expert in the world. I will straight up admit that. Okay. Um, but I have been doing my best to kind of reach out to people. Not, I mean, I'm trying to keep up with education and trying to keep people, um, trying to show them that you can still help the world uh, during a time of crisis and you can still do your own socially distant projects. But I've really enjoyed this opportunity to reach out one-on-one -on -one to people and FaceTime. One of my best friends lives in Dallas now. And so we've just been kind of doing FaceTime. Like if we're cooking, we'll just FaceTime each other and just set it up and just hang out that way. So it's been a cool way to connect um, with people who maybe aren't in the same city or maybe who are and give you an excuse to really talk to people that you don't, you know, like at the end of your day, you don't think, oh, well, I'm going to call someone. And now that's becoming more of a reality. So I vibe with that. I really like that. Okay. Connecting more with friends is, and family is, is amazing. What about, what about with regards to your holding your title? I mean, how has it helped you maybe professionally? Um, mm -hmm. How has it helped you kind of um, connect more with people online given, given your Miss Earth title? Yeah. So I've, like I said, I've been trying to do a lot of media. I've written a lot of articles on sustainability, um, different ways that you can make your household more sustainable, your diet more sustainable, um, you know, tips and tricks for living well, um, especially during Earth Month, there was a lot going on there. So I definitely stayed busy, but it was more, you know, me behind a computer on the same mission, but kind of using this new platform to do it. And okay. I, I hope that people are receiving it well and people are listening um, and that people are kind of in a, in a climate that they can make a change at this point. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. Like, I think that, um, you know, as, as we come out of this uh, terrible situation, I think that there's a, there will be a huge opportunity to come out of this in, in a better place. You know, that's the goal I hope, right. For everyone to be a better version of themselves when society and, and, you know, the world reopens. And I think a lot of countries and a lot of cities um, are trying to do the same as well. Like they're maybe going to create um, car free zones in the city centers to reduce pollution. And, or they'll, uh, that was one, um, one thing I heard that Milan was doing in, in Northern Italy. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's important for us all on an individual level to also think about how we want to come out of this and, and how we can be kind of better versions of ourselves, and, and how we can prevent instead of treat. And I think this goes back to, you know, how we started this conversation and, and, and your studies. You know, how do we all, um, you know, take better care of our health, take better care of our own diets, put less crap into the, into the atmosphere and into the, our oceans um, so that we at least, you know, we can kind of try to be better caretakers of the planet. Um, I know that doesn't, it doesn't help much with regards to viral infections, but maybe it'll help us all feel a little better uh, and live a little healthier. Uh, and, and have some quality. I mean, cleaner it has lungs. Impact on air quality, and that is an invaluable resource right now. Clean air and fresh air. Yeah. Another thing that I just did want to touch on um, is, I know that it's easy right now to turn off the news and stop paying attention to kind of what's going on in the media because it can be devastating and it can be repetitive. But um, I did, you know, it's definitely a time to remember that in America we have elections going on uh, for oh. the president coming up soon. And we need to make sure that our, our environmental policies are still being considered um, underneath all of this COVID crisis. That's kind of what everyone's talking about. But at the end of the day, Washington right now is repealing numerous, numerous hundreds of environmental action initiatives um, and repealing environmental policy in regards to endangered species, um, air pollutions, emissions that are acceptable, uh, toxic substances that are acceptable. And a lot of that is going under the radar right now. So I would encourage everyone uh, to take this time to also do their own research, um, figure out what environmental plans and environmental initiatives 
you can support through the election um, and really make your own decision about how you want to vote, not just based on um, business, but also on the environment and the future of our society and our planet. It's a, it's a great message to have. I think a lot of people are very, very fearful that uh, the countries and, and the leaders of the countries and the business leaders are all going to be in such a rush mm -hmm. to restart the economies and to, and to get business back up and running that the uh, environment will be a, a second or a third or a fourth or a fifth consideration um, mm -hmm. to just getting people back to work and stuff like that. And as important as it is to get people back to work because people need to earn an income and take care of their families and everything like that. I just feel like now is also a time where we can all get back to work in a more sustainable way. Mm -hmm. and, and make that part of the plan when you're going back because we have the time to lay the plans before we have to initiate them right now. So it's, it's easy enough to make that a consideration instead of an afterthought. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like you said, you said it right away, actually, like, do people need to make a daily commute? Um, mm -hmm. Maybe maybe people can work from home twice to twice a day or three, three days a week or something like that mm -hmm. uh, and go into the office just on a few days. And we can have these kind of split systems where there's less people moving uh, at once. So there's less strain on our um, public uh, transport services and mm -hmm. our personal and our personal car usage. I agree. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to vote in the Turkish elections. I don't even know when they are actually. So I'm just here. I'm just here in Istanbul as a as a total freeloader. Um, but I did I did read that uh, tourists that are stuck here in Istanbul will not be fined on their departures this year because they've overstayed their visa. So I got a 90 day visa when I arrived uh, on a, a visa on arrival when I arrived. So I can pretty much stay as long as needed. So that's nice to know. Well, that's probably the longest you've been anywhere in a long time, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe almost 20 years without moving. This, yes, seven weeks without moving is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, look, I mean, Libby, thank you so much for your time today. It's been, uh, it's been really wonderful talking with you. It's been really wonderful learning um, about your life, your career, uh, your studies, uh, your future profession, and, and what makes you tick and, and what you find really important and really valuable. Um, do you have anything? Did we miss out in, on anything? Is there anything else you wanted to share? I think I just did the plug that I needed to do. Um, kind okay. of a comment. <laughs> All right. Well, look, um, again, thank you so much for your time and, and good luck getting your message out. Uh, and, and good luck just being, you know, a human being in a terribly difficult time. And I don't know if that cat needs to run more or if there's some diet food for him or what's okay. going on but that cat is since huge I, since i got him he has lost four to five pounds so he was he was a chonk he was big <laughs> and wow. he's got diet so um he's he's actually the appropriate weight he's just big bone not a lie <laughs> you know i i was funny i've been going there's these there are these in istanbul it's famous for having um stray cats mm -hmm. they're they're everywhere so there's this park that i go to for people listening the real interview is over now we're just having a personal chat and you guys can stay on if you want there's a there's a there's this park full of cats uh all stray cats and i used to go in every day and feed the cats a little bit feed the cats a little bit mm -hmm. and they were all like pretty small like you know not not so big but then i got then i found my little kitten and he was sitting in the palm of my hand and now all these cats that I used to see a few weeks ago look like monsters compared to my little tiny kitten. And, and Tubby is a beautiful, beautiful feline species, but that did scare me also. A small tiger. <laughs> small, a small tiger. Okay. Uh, well, look, thank you very much. I know you, uh, you have some time restraints and we'll, we'll hopefully catch up again soon. But take care, stay safe, uh, and so good luck. Today. Thank you. Have a great uh, day. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye. Okay, everyone, uh, that was the amazing Libby Hill, uh, currently the reigning Miss Earth USA. And she, uh, yeah, we just had a talk. We caught up. Uh, I'd never met her before. Uh, she contacted me through a mutual friend. And I said, yeah, I want to learn about Earth and sustainability and what Miss Earth USA does, because I was ignorant about the pageant system. Um, and it was wonderful to catch up with her. It was wonderful to learn uh, about what makes her passionate. And I'm glad she got back from her, um, her ocean cleanup and beach cleanup um, trip in Hawaii. And she was able to make it back uh, to Texas before the, kind of the United States shut down 
and hit its worst part. And she did mention she had asthma, which is obviously one of the dangerous uh, pre-existing conditions for COVID-19. So it's good that she's stayed indoors uh, and she's stayed healthy through all of this. Uh, if you guys like these COVID calls and these Instagram lives, you can always catch all of them on my YouTube channel, which is just Ryan J. Pyle. On that YouTube channel, you will also find full episodes of Tough Rides China and Tough Rides India, which are my adventure motorcycle trips that I've done in the past. Who knows if I'll ever do another adventure motorcycle trip again. Hopefully I will, but uh, yeah, we'll have to wait a while, I guess. Anyways, it's me from Istanbul. Take care, guys. I'll be on in a few more hours with someone else. Check my stories.